Okay, so we're going to start. Everybody's on mute. Um, and I'd like to, as people are signing in, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. It's been odd taking all these events virtual, but for this one, it really feels appropriate. And you know, if you ask why we're addressing this issue, a couple of years ago, the New York Post started running exposés on the staggering rates of sex trafficking happening here in New York. And I was shocked to learn that it just wasn't just a problem in New York City, but actually here in the Hudson Valley as well. After that, Low Hood published an article, a woman who runs a Hudson Valley organization that helps victims of trafficking is quoted as saying, human trafficking is occurring in every corner of every neighborhood in the Hudson Valley. And I remember being shocked to hear that and immediately thinking to myself, we have to do something about this. That's why I immediately introduced legislation to help raise awareness, hold perpetrators accountable, and better protect victims, and why each year since those reports, I brought together a panel of experts to address this topic, um, to speak candidly with other neighbors about the issue here and provide you with the tools that you need to stay safe. And, you know, when we talk about holding perpetrators accountable, um, we also saw the bail reform uh, legislation that was put into place. And we had so many people come forward. It was bipartisan, uh, the DAs, law enforcement. We had great press conferences and roundtables and then COVID hit. But there are so many things that fall under that bail reform. You know, the intention of it was great. Nobody should be held in jail because they can't pay um, their uh, bail. And, uh, but there are some serious crimes and stalking is one of them. So when you think about all of this with the human trafficking that all comes into play. So that's why we're still trying to uh, tweak the bail reform law. And also as this year, as we all settle into this remote world and with everyone, even our youngest neighbors taking to the internet for work, school and entertainment, this event is more important than ever. I always say awareness is the key to prevention and that's what this event is all about. So I'd like to um, thank everybody for joining. And also if anyone has any questions during the event, please enter them into the question and answer. We will uh, address that at the end. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Courtney. Uh, uh, Courtney Albert, I'm sorry, Courtney, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll mute myself. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you could bring it back up right to the beginning. Perfect. So thank you so much for having me. I wanted to start the evening off by setting the tone and sharing what trafficking is and what it's not and having us have a common understanding of what we're talking about tonight. And I put this image up because this is what I call my quote unquote perfect victim slide. I think the media often portrays victims in a certain way. If you see movies like Taken, I think so many of us come away with an idea of what human trafficking is that actually isn't accurate. So I have this image up here because I think a lot of assumptions are that victims are only young girls, that a lot of times the perpetrator is a stranger, and that only force is used, that maybe they're kidnapped and that they're tied up and they're held either, they're tied up, they're bound by chains or they're behind locked doors. And that is just not the true image of what human trafficking is. That can happen in a minority of cases, but it's really not the majority. And it's really important that we have a clear understanding of what it really truly looks like and what elements are involved. So to start off, just a few facts. If you look globally around the world, approximately 71% of the victims are women and girls. So that means that almost 30% of the victims are men and boys. So understanding that victims can be men and women, adults and children. And if, again, if you look at the numbers globally, 25% of the victims of human trafficking are children. That means that 75% of the victims are over the age of 18. So the majority of the victims are actually adults. Another thing that I like to point to in this particular image is we see Taylor Swift here tied up. 
a lot of people can really wrap their heads around why someone can't leave a situation if they're tied up or they're behind a, a locked door. What's harder for people to understand is that when it comes to human trafficking, there are other elements involved. There are things like fraud and psychological coercion that can be extremely powerful and that hold people in these situations. And the final piece, we have this image of this guy kind of um, coming down, that traffickers perhaps are all males, and that's not true. Traffickers can be men, they can be women, they can be individuals, couples, gangs, full-fledged organized crime. And unfortunately for most victims, the traffickers are people they already know. They are not strangers. So when you hear of these situations of a kidnapping off the street by a stranger, that again is the minority of cases. For young women and, and girls, a lot of times they know their perpetrator and that perpetrator is often a family friend or even a family member. Next slide. So let's talk about what human trafficking is. Human trafficking is a crime that involves the exploitation of a person for the purpose of compelled labor or commercial sex through the use of force, fraud, and or coercion. So let's start at the beginning. It's exploitation. This is a crime against a person where one person or a group of people are exploiting another for their own benefit. It's a, first and foremost a human rights issue. It violates people's dignity and basic human rights. The next piece, for the purpose of compelled labor or a commercial sex act. What that means is I know we hear a lot about, and tonight we're talking a lot about sex trafficking. And that is a huge problem, but I would be remiss if I didn't highlight that when you talk about human trafficking, it involves not just sex trafficking, but also labor trafficking in a wide variety of different industries. Agriculture, construction, manufacturing, hospitality, restaurants, domestic servitude, which is a maid or nanny in someone's home. So you do find it in a wide variety of industries. And there can also be an overlap where there are cases where someone is being forced into both sex trafficking and also labor trafficking at the same time. And then we have this last piece of the de definition that there's the use of force, fraud, and or coercion. So there's usually a mixture of more than one um, of these things. And I'm gonna be going into more detail about the, what these are. Next slide. To help understand human trafficking, there's something called the AMP model. You need an action means and a purpose for it to be considered trafficking. And the action is how the person got into the situation and what's happening, Are they how they're being recruited or moved around or advertised. You have the means, either force, fraud, or coercion. They're either in compelled labor or in forced into the sex trade. And what's important here over on the right side is that if someone is under the age of 18 and they are found in commercial sex, they are viewed as a human trafficking victim without having to prove the means. So what that means for law enforcement and for prosecutors is that even though means are involved, when it comes to children under the age of 18, you don't need to prove those means because the child is under the age of consent. Next slide. So let's talk about the means. At the beginning, I have that image of Taylor Swift who's tied up. That would be an element of force, right? Someone is bound against their will. And I think it's easy for us to have an understanding of why it is that force might keep someone in a situation. Some other examples of force are physical assault, sexual assault, confinement, kidnapping. And then there's other things that we may not think of deprivation of basic needs, like keeping someone from being able to eat and drink and sleep. There have been cases where victims have been woken up on the hour to keep them unbalanced, to keep it so that they can't think straight. And then facilitated drug use is another type of force. One of my clients um, in particular, she, her partner um, was actually her trafficker and he would hold her down and force her to take drugs. So that's an element of force, being forced to take drugs. Now, when we look at these next two elements of fraud and coercion, these are easier to conceal, 
They can be overlooked, but they are extremely powerful. And these are instruments that are usually used prior to force. So things like fraud, a fraudulent employment contract, someone thinks they're going for one job and, and that's not the job they get. Or maybe there's false promises of love, of employment, of acceptance and coercion, threats to, to yourself, threats to a loved one or threats to a pet, threats of arrest, blackmail, and I know one of the things that we're talking about today is how technology folds into this. Technology can be used as a source of blackmail uh, for victims. So if images are taken online, um, that image can then be used by the perpetrator to threaten reputational harm. I'm gonna share this with your family if you don't do what I ask. Other things like psychological manipulation and control, I'll get to in more depth in a little bit. Next slide. Something else that's really important to understand is that human trafficking is not a new issue and it's not a siloed phenomenon. It intersects with all of these other issues that you see here up on this screen and many more. It intersects with issues such as poverty, substance abuse, immigration, intimate partner violence and child abuse. And in many of these instances, these issues are things that make people vulnerable. The key to human trafficking is really vulnerability. Traffickers look for vulnerability. And if they're able to find vulnerability and target it, that's what they're going to use to recruit somebody. So if someone's in desperate need to make money to survive, then that might be used as leverage. If someone has a substance use problem or addiction, that might be used as leverage. So it's important to understand that this intersects, that human trafficking intersects with all of these different issues. Next slide. This slide is something that I call the totality of the victim experience. And I always find that it's important to share this because victims experience extends beyond just what happens during the actual trafficking. It's really important to understand what that person's backstory is. What are the vulnerabilities that are at play? Were, were there prior victimizations before the person was trafficked? So looking at what the backstory is, then looking at, okay, what happens to that person during the trafficking? What elements of force, fraud, and coercion were used? And then also looking at how has that impacted that individual? How has what their backstory and the trafficking experience impacted them? both mentally and physically, what kind of trauma symptoms do they have? And because of those, what barriers are there for them to exit a situation or potentially recover? And as I go through this, I will be weaving a little bit about technology through this. If you look at backstory and you look at vulnerabilities, a lot of common vulnerabilities are things like that intersectionality slide that I talked about, that the more vulnerabilities someone has, the more likely they are to be targeted by a trafficker. So if you have someone that um, has a history of abuse, if you have someone who's living in poverty and, and needs to make ends meet, they may be more vulnerable. But technology has also made access to a wide variety or a wider group of people for potential traffickers. So now you find traffickers do go online, they do troll on different sites trying to identify vulnerable victims that they can then try to manipulate. Next slide. And it's really hard to know who a trafficker is, right? They don't look like monsters. These are all images of human traffickers. Human traffickers, just like victims, can be men and women. They can be couples, right? They can be well-respected people in their community. They don't look like monsters. And a lot of times they don't approach their victims in that way. They approach offering the very thing that the victim wants. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the trafficking experience itself and, the, and what that is like for victims. During trafficking, unfortunately, for the majority of victims, it's a mixture of violence, coercive control, and exploitation. 
And when I work with, I work as a clinician with survivors. And some of the things that, I, that are important for me that I think are really important to understand are what kinds of violence did the person endure? What levels and intensity? How long were they in this situation? Was it two weeks, two months, two years, five years? Because that has an impact on that person. And I also want to know, what is the relationship that that person has to the perpetrator? Was that perpetrator a stranger, just an acquaintance that maybe they did meet online and started to build a relationship with? Or was it a family member? Was it a boyfriend or a husband? It's important to understand what that relationship is. Next slide. So October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I wanted to highlight, particularly with sex trafficking, and something that I have seen a lot in my work with clients, is the overlap between domestic violence and sex trafficking. A lot of my clients actually have been trafficked by their partner. And either they were one of many women that were trafficked, or they were the only woman being trafficked. And I think that's another thing that's important for us to understand, that sex trafficking can look very differently that sometimes a trafficker is only trafficking one person. And I, I like this quote on the top because actually one of my clients said it. Sex trafficking is like intimate partner violence on steroids. It's taking it to a whole new level. And this is a study that was done that said many sex trafficked women experience exceedingly high rates of physical and sexual violence that are perpetrated by traffickers, by their partners, and by their clients, Johns. And so you see this overlap. Remember, I talked about intersectionality. There's this overlap between domestic violence and human trafficking. Also interesting in this study, they looked at 28 adult male offenders who were arrested for domestic trafficking. So that's trafficking of victims within the United States. Look at the numbers, 71% had a documented history of intimate partner violence as well. 64% documented history of general violence and 46% documented history of additional sexual violence. That these perpetrators are committing other crimes as well. Next slide. For the victims of trafficking, particularly when you have the perpetrator being the partner the boyfriend, the husband of the victim. The power and control dynamics um, are really powerful. And again, I want one of the things I hope to get across today is the importance of coercive control and psychological coercion and why it is that it's very difficult for victims to leave. That instead of looking at it as a violence model, really trying to look at it as a coercive control framework. Because we often assume, right, violence and discrete moments of violence end. However, coercive control never ends. It does not stop. Even if the beating has stopped, even if an assault has stopped, the coercive control, this pattern depressive behavior, using fear, intimidation, and threatened repercussions that instill compliance are ever present. And I have had so many clients share these exact same things. This is what they see. There's destruction of property in their home, brandishing of weapons, boasting about the number of weapons that the perpetrator has, threats or actual harm to friends, to loved ones, to pets. I had a client whose best friend who had been trying to get her out of the situation, her partner, trafficker, threatened to kill this woman dressed up in plastic, took one of his weapons, she thought he was going to do it. Isolation and then monitoring. Monitoring through technology. Here's another piece about technology. Someone does not have to have their trafficker right next to them in order to be monitored and controlled. There's video surveillance that can be put up within the home, GPS systems that can be put in their phones, Someone is constantly texting and calling and the victim has to reply or there will be a problem when that person gets home. Next slide. And with trafficking, 
there's this additional coercive control tactic that relates to reputational harm or legal ramifications. Threats of exposure about the sale of sex. You're the one who's gonna get arrested for prostitution, not me. You're the one who's gonna get deported, not me. Or your loved one who's not legal, I'm gonna get the immigration officials out to get them. Threats to out someone who's in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community. That, is, that could be something that would force someone to be rejected by their family. And then use of ads, pornographic pictures and videos can be used to instill compliance, threatening to show those to other people. And also something that these traffickers often do is that they use and put those images, they put the advertisements onto the client's phone. They don't use their own phones. They put it under the client's name. They use the client's phone, my client's phones, their victim's phones, because that way they can say, oh no, it wasn't me. This victim did it of her own accord. Next slide. Evan Stark, who coined the term coercive control, and I think this is a really powerful definition, something I want to kind of close on. The aim is total domination. And this rings so true to me because one of my clients said to me, after she had been out of this situation, her husband was her trafficker. In one session, she had said to me, it wasn't enough for him to control certain aspects, he had to have total domination. The primary outcome of coercive control is a condition of entrapment that can be hostage-like in the harms it inflicts on dignity, liberty, and autonomy, and personhood, as well as physical and psychological integrity. It's extremely powerful. Next slide. And so, as I move on to Dave, who'll be coming up next and talking about what we're seeing in Dutchess County, I want to hopefully have instilled in you the different elements that can be involved, how powerful coercive control can be, and how complex it can therefore be for victims to be identified and for them to recover, that they oftentimes have been impacted by what's happened both physically and mentally, and it can impact how they look. So if you remember back to the slide I started with, my perfect victim slide of Taylor Swift being tied up and looking so innocent. And I want you to now look at this slide of these cats, <laughs> that sometimes this is actually more like what you might see with a trafficking survivor. Maybe they're really startled and scared or angry. That this may be more of the, what you get as opposed to that first image. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, thank you. Thank you, Courtney and David. I think you have to unmute. Sorry. First uh, person to un not unmute. Um, while I start to s share my screen, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is David Garcia. I work for the Dutchess County Department of Community and Family Services in the Children's Services Unit. I am the Dutchess County Safer Safe Harbor Coordinator, as well as the coordinator of the Dutchess County Task Force. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen with you, hopefully now. So I just want to start off by saying that uh, some of the things that we're talking about as a group can really be triggering. So it's important that you all take care of yourself while we're going through this presentation. So we're talking about survivor support and survivor support can be viewed in uh, pretty much three stages. There's the immediate stage. Uh, which is approximately 24, 72 hours. Um, and we're looking to provide survivors with safety, medical bed, new food. Um, they're short term, one to three months. Um, we're looking at housing, mental health and legal, and long term, education, training and employment. Now, survivors are not linear. They're not gonna go from stage one to stage two and stage three. They're gonna have to need, get their meet, needs met and anytime their needs are not met during this process, they may revert back to the trafficker who, in their view, has met those needs. So when we work with survivors, the relationship should be a, a collaboration. It's not about me telling them what they need and making them do it. It's 
given them choice, a choice that was taken from them by their trafficker. So we emphasize at every step their choice when it's safe to do so. I work with youth and some youth can't make this, the choice to go home when they're in foster care. So we have to find a safe foster care placement for them. So that's a choice they can't make, but there are other things that they can choose, how their room looks, um, how they want to dress, um, what would they like to eat for dinner. So we want to emphasize choice and give the survivor an opportunity to um, regain some strength from that. We also want to listen carefully to them. This is their life. They know their life better than us. And we want to make sure that we're listening to meet their needs. And we have to let survivors have predictability and control over their own healing. Everybody knows what best works for them. And we have to respect, give them that respect as uh, for the youth that I work with and of course as adults. So a little statistics uh, for youth trafficking. So as I said, I work for the Dutchess County Safe Harbor and my clientele is youth primarily involved in child welfare or the juvenile justice system. And they, uh, sorry. I just had some background noise. And youth in the juvenile justice and child welfare system are at high risk of being trafficked. Uh, in the USA, children are most likely to be exploited by their families and friends, as Courtney said. As Courtney said earlier, young women and girls are recruited in the commercial sex industry due to economic need, maybe family and peer encouragement. There's reports estimate that maybe as many as 50 to 80% of child sex trafficking victims have had contact with the child welfare system, as well as the juvenile justice system. So it's important for Safe Harbor to be involved with um, child welfare in trying to identify youth who are at high risk. In 2007, New York State Office of Children and Family Services identified 2,652 child trafficking victims statewide. 85% of them had contact with the child welfare system. So we implemented this uh, initiative in New York State. Um, we were the first state in the country to have the uh, Safe Harbor Act initiative. So what does it look like in Dutchess County? Well, in 2015, we started collecting statistics. I got to move my group over here because they're blocking my screen. In 2015, we identified, we received four referrals of youth who are at risk of being trafficked or are trafficked. So there's no statistics here for 2014. And most people, when we do a live presentation, say, well, maybe there wasn't any traffic in 2014. Like it just started in 2015. Well, that is not so, of course. We only saw four because we just started implementing, uh, identifying these youth who are in the child welfare system. As we went along in 2016, we had four. 2017, as we started doing more awareness trainings and uh, edu educating the community about it, we received 26. Um, we boomed to two, in 2018 to 41, and in 2019, we had 41. Of these numbers, the greater the greatest number population is in the city of Poughkeepsie. Uh, most of these victims were African American and they were female, uh, heterosexual. Um, 2020 so far, we've only had 13 as of June 30th. Now, of course, everyone knows we had COVID and COVID we pretty much shut everything down and we thought, well, Maybe it's shutting down trafficking. So let me check. I checked with the, our regional partners, and we all had a dip in the numbers of uh, youth being referred to us. Um, but we expect that as we start to open up again as a country, that we're going to have more youth identified when they are face to face with mandated reporters and people have access to them to, they have access to other individuals to tell their story. So here's a little breakdown of the numbers for 2019. 35 female, six male, the majority are heterosexual. Our age group, and it's consistent nationwide, is that 
we're in the 16 to 18. Um, in the past, we were seeing numbers from 12 to 15 was the majority, but we're seeing a boost that most of the individuals involved are in between 16 and 18. And in Dutchess County, we had had three youth confirmed as trafficking victims. So what are some of the indicators that uh, youth may present? So you may see youth with tattoos or brands, signs of ownership, their trafficker may uh, put a dollar sign or their nickname on their body to show ownership. Um, a child who runs away frequently from school or, or their placement, there's truancy involved, there's indicators of reports of domestic violence in the fa family and as well as their own relationships. Um, there may be a stalking situation. They may have an older boyfriend and we're not talking one or two years, we're talking, you know, a greater number of years between the two of them. Suddenly they have unexplained possessions. You know, everyone has a phone nowadays, but now this youth may have two phones or they had a flip phone before and now they have the latest iPhone and they always seem to have the latest iPhone, but you know that their family um, doesn't have the money to provide that. So where are they getting that from? Um, most teens are already attached to their phone, but we're looking at a more excessive attachment to their cell phone. They're getting text messages from people. They don't want, they're being more secretive. There's a disconnect, disconnection from social support. So they might isolate themselves a little bit more from their normal friends and family. Um, a lot of street slang for the sex work, um, age and age inappropriate sexual behavior, or sexually transmitted infections. And for human uh, labor trafficking, the minors are working more than that they may be in school. So I want you to see a typical, what we would say is a typical uh, youth who we may come in contact with. So you heard Courtney earlier say that a lot of people have this vision of uh, trafficking through the movies Taken. Um, this is a little PSA by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That I, I like because I think it represents what's happening. Our youth are vulnerable and their vulnerabilities are exploited as Courtney mentioned earlier. Um, if you were in person, I would ask you to shout out how many vulnerabilities you see happening in this video, but you're at home and I'm here. So I'm gonna ask you to look at this video and see if you can pick out some vulnerabilities. And at the end, I'll share what I saw as vulnerabilities. This is only about a minute. Can you hear it? You ladies from around here? Action. We need you to talk or to drive. My bad. Okay, so hopefully you were able to see that video as I did and hey, we can get out of this again. And what did you identify as her vulner the youth's vulnerabilities? She was in a home that was chaotic. Family was arguing. She was upset over this. She ran away. She was on the street. She had nowhere to go. 
She was hungry. A female approached her. She went with them. Those are just some of the vulnerabilities that our youth are facing when they run away from placement, run away from their home, situations that they can get involved with. So our safe harbor programs are built to help support youth who are on the street, who are running away, who need someone to provide a meal without anything in, in response to support them. Um, I run a prevention education group called Not a Number with uh, youth. And before and after every um, session, there's five modules, before and after we ask youth to take a index card and write something on it at the end, um, whatever they want, make a comment, a question, a concern. Uh, we're hoping that we get disclosures about something that's happening with them. And sometimes we get smiley faces and good job. And one youth who was in my group said, this human trafficking is the exploitation of my vulnerabilities. And it's true. You know, if we can teach children to recognize what their vulnerabilities are and recognize what exploitation looks like, we can prevent, hopefully, um, youth from being trafficked. So I'm going to pass it on to my uh, compadre in Putnam County, Mary Beth Ross, who also does safe harbor there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. And thank you, Mary Beth, for coming on. Welcome. I'll stop sharing my screen in a second when I figure out how to do it. All right, Mary Beth, we're all ready for you. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everybody and thank you, Senator Serena, for having me. This is a great, great forum and I'm really happy to be here. So I'd like to start a little bit about some of the things that we've been talking about. And I know that we had a great overview from Courtney and from David and we've gotten a lot of information. So I, I know we talked about coercive control and we talked about choice, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about collaboration. And I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing and working with other agencies and groups in Putnam County, things that we can all do across the entire region. Should I be pressing another button here? No. Yeah, not... You're doing good. Okay. I didn't know if you could see me or not. Okay. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Putnam County. As you know, we are a little bit smaller than Dutchess County. And so in this year, in 2020, we have had, um, with COVID and everything, we have had eight referrals. And they have all been females, and they have all been heterosexual, and they, they go from the ages of 12 to 17, with the average age being 15, which pretty much falls along with a lot of the stats that we see, I think. Um, within that, five of the young ladies um, reported themselves as multiracial, two were Hispanic, and one was white. So one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about is that we do, as Dave mentioned, we work a lot with social services and we, we work at the schools and we do a lot of training, but we also do something that's a little bit different that I wanted to talk about. It's just sort of another way to get to kids. A lot of the things that we do is when we try to get, um, develop partnerships with other agencies in the county. And one that we just, that we uh, developed is called Voices Carry. And what that is, is a, a partnership we developed in Putnam County with the Co-Care Center, which is a mental, mental health agency and also a mental health association in Putnam. And what we did with that is we came up with a program, actually two programs at one, in one. And what we did is we used um, spoken word and hip hop as a way to teach kids resilience and to talk about their feelings. So it was a really interesting, program that we did and it was the first one of its kind for Safe Harbor in New York State where we, we partnered with a person who is a, a very well-known rap instructor and he and he came and he taught our kids. So over the course of four weeks they were able to really kind of talk about what was important to them and let us get to know them and just sort of we could you know if they had vulnerabilities as David had mentioned we could perhaps 
see them, get to know them, and then offer them services. So it worked out very, very well. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic, um, it stopped for a while, but it's something that we are hoping to bring back, um, probably, hopefully by the end of the year or maybe next year. Um, I also wanted to mention that in January of this year, we in Putnam County, Safe Harbor of Putnam County, um, launched a free mobile app. So what the app does is it it's called Safe Harbor Putnam County, and it really helps us educate the community about what trafficking looks like and, and what to look for. So for instance, it gives you definitions of, of trafficking and CSEC crimes. Um, it gives indicators to assess a youth risk of trafficking. Uh, it, resor it gives resources and programs in Putnam County for, for youth who may be trafficked or those who are at risk of being trafficked. I could just show you, it's, it's right here, and it's available on the App Store and also in Google Play, and it's called Safe Harbor Putnam County. And then another thing that happened with us that we think is going to be really uh, great in terms of working with the region and educating people is that um, Safe, Harbor, Safe Harbor Putnam County, uh, working in collaboration with the Child Advocacy Center of Putnam County, was awarded a $50,000 training grant from the National Children's Alliance. So we're really, really excited about some of the work we can do with that. One of the things that, we're, that we were able to do is for the Putnam County, County Sheriff's Department, we were able to buy a new computer and a forensic program, which is really great because it, it, it really helped to conduct a thorough investigation of computer hardware for things like human trafficking or for um, child sex abuse images and other CSEC crimes. Um, so in the investigations, what we find is that in many of these investigations, as you may know, there are many, many devices. There are phones, there are tablets, there are computers, there are laptops, there are many of these devices that are used. So this lets us, you know, lets the police look at them and do a thorough investigation and it's better evidence collection, but it's also, which is kind of good for teens, it's a quicker turnaround time in returning property to some of the victims and survivors, because we all know how much teens like their phones and their, their devices. So um, and then just to follow up with that training of the training grant, we're also um, able to conduct a training session for a, um, a new interviewing technique, which is called the FETI, which is forensic, experiential trauma interview and we are training um, 50 partner partners of ours in law enforcement and social services and service providers in this methodology it uses the latest research in trauma and memory so it helps us in a very groundbreaking way to talk to victims and, and to get information for whatever we need it for in a way that does not traumatize victims so we're really excited about that and then lastly, um, we, will be preventing, we will be presenting um, coming up in November a webinar with Dr. Sharon Cooper, who is a forensic pediatrician. She has appointments um, at um, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the um, United States, I'm sorry, I forgot what it was, the University of North Carolina and the Uni Uniform Services University of Health Sciences. So we're very excited. Dr. Cooper has lectured about at 300 you know, um, conferences, both nationally and internationally. She, she consults to Interpol, she does a lot. She's consulted with about 45 countries who are working on um, the rescue and identification of child and adolescent victims of sexual exploitation. So we're really, really lucky to have her. We're very excited for this upcoming um, webinar because she'll be talking about a lot about child sex abuse images, which is an area that is very related to, as Courtney was saying, she touched upon it briefly. Uh, it's related to trafficking in a lot of the ways. You see that it's another crime against children. And she's gonna talk a little bit about how it's different from other crimes against children and how, it's, how, how we uh, as agencies and service providers can best provide services to child victims and survivors. So in a nutshell, that's kind of a little bit about what's going on in Putnam County. And I believe at this point, I'm turning it over to Megan. Thank you, Mary Beth. Hi, Megan. And, and Megan, I don't know if you and Becca are gonna go at the same time, however you guys wanna do it. 
Um, I know you guys are going to talk about tools and tips from Grace Smith House. So however you choose to do it is fine by me. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. So I, I'm actually going to kick us off. Uh, my name is Becca Polanski. I'm one of the community educators with Grace Smith House, which is a domestic violence agency in Dutchess County. And Megan and I are the prevention and education department, which means that we give a number of different workshops around education prevention. And we have been trained so by Courtney so wonderfully to give prevention tips for human trafficking as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start our PowerPoint up here. So hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, so in order to really address prevention, um, and sort of the things that come along with that, we have to talk about what's happening in human trafficking as well as what's not happening in tra human trafficking. As I believe pretty much everyone who has presented already tonight has mentioned, everyone is attached to their phones right now. People are constantly sharing information, things are constantly being shared on social media, and a lot of false information gets spread as well. So to sort of address that, I want to talk about three of the major things that you hear about when you hear people talking about human trafficking. The first is the sort of target parking lot post, right? There are plenty of these on Facebook. I see them constantly. I know Megan mentions that she sees them all the time. And generally what they are is a post that says, someone was following me around the store, um, you know, they were going to grab me, they were going to put me in their car, everyone please be careful. And I really just want to revisit the point that Courtney and Dave made earlier, which is that trafficking does not usually happen from strangers, right? Can that happen? Absolutely. But the odds that someone is going to abduct someone from a busy store parking lot, stick them in the back of their white van, as it were, those odds are really low. Most victims, um, when they are sort of lured into a trafficking situation, whether it's sex or labor trafficking, are done so are are lured in through more underhanded means. That coercion that we talked about, that persuasion, they're already vulnerable. So when you see posts like that, I think it's really important to ask yourself: if people were regularly getting abducted from the Target parking lot, would I have heard about it? Again, can it happen? Absolutely. But it's a very, very small part of what contributes to human trafficking. Most victims enter the situation in some way, shape, or form willingly. They've either been groomed over time, it's survival, right? They're approaching that person because they think that person is going to provide for them. It's those false promises. And the people that are initiating that trafficking, the traffickers aren't always that sort of creepy old person, that sketchy guy that you see. It's like in the video that Dave showed, that girl was approached by another girl who was maybe around her age, a little bit older, someone that was relatable to her, and that's how she was able to get her into that situation. Because you're more likely to trust someone that you can identify with that you think relates to you. Um, so again, if you see someone that you think is following you around the store, is following your children. Could that person's intentions be bad? Absolutely. But there could be another underhanded reason for that person doing that. Secondly, something I want to touch on, which isn't on my slide here, is the personal information scam. And this is actually more common. So this is someone who's be being trafficked because their legal documents are being kept from them. They've given personal information, they've given their license over, maybe they were promised a job, maybe they were promised money, a nice place to stay, and now they're being kept in that situation because their means of getting out are being withheld from them. And then lastly, I just wanna reemphasize sort of Courtney's perfect victim image, right? Not all tra trafficking victims are chained up. Most aren't. Most people who are trafficked, that's not visible to someone who isn't educated about the signs, who isn't educated about what some of those things that Dave talked about might be, whether it's suddenly they have all of these really nice personal possessions or they're working more often there than they're in school. Coercive control and threats are incredibly powerful and that can keep someone from leaving their traffickers from seeking help and it can be the reason that they go back to their trafficker and we know that especially from intimate partner violence. 
that person doesn't have an external support system, they're likely to go back to that person, right? Someone can be trafficked and still be living at home, seeing the people that they see regularly, and still going through that experience of trafficking, right? So what are the facts then? If we know what's not happening, then what is actually happening? As I had mentioned before, people are generally recruited when they are brought into a trafficking situation. They're not plucked off the street. They're not plucked off the sidewalk. They're coerced. They're forced. They, maybe they've been made empty promises, right? It can be promises that they're going to get a job that's going to pay them a lot of money or if you move here, I'll marry you, I'll love you, and then they're in a labor trafficking situation where it's like, actually, now I've taken away your immigration documents and I'm gonna force you to work. And then sort of those other things that we touched on as well. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Megan. All right, so prevention and education is what we do and prevention raises awareness. So what is prevention? Prevention is an action of stopping something from happening or arising. And how do you do that? Well, you do that in a couple different ways. You do it through education, dialogue, internet safety, reporting if you think something is happening or if you are concerned about someone, and resources. What is available to you? So education. Education is probably the biggest prevention tool that you can have at your disposal. So through education comes research. So knowing the red flags of human trafficking, prevalence in your community, um, what's happening in your community because it is happening and your community resources that are available. Also um, community education and education in your schools. So advocating for that education. So as Becca said, like we educate on various different topics in the community and in school. Dave has his youth education. Know what's available. So if you need it, it's there. If you have a young adult in your life, right? Provide them with that education. That education is not only just for kids, it can be for school staff, teachers, admin, nurses, counselors who are spending a good, maybe not right now during COVID, but generally eight to 10 hours a day with those young adults in school, right? Educate them as well. They may see a warning sign that a parent or caregiver doesn't see at home, right? Provide that education, okay? Knowing what those indicators are that Dave spoke about, knowing what vulnerabilities, you know, a young adult might have, or even an adult, um, because education equals awareness. Right? And awareness is prevention. So dialogue, right? Starting that conversation, okay? That's where it all begins. And starting that conversation can be the hardest thing to do, right? But don't let it being hard or you being uncomfortable stop that conversation from happening, okay? And you start that conversation by simply asking even an adult or young adult in your life, how was your day? What happened, right? Just being interested. And then modeling best practices if that conversation starts rolling. Put your phone down, right? If you wanna talk about something serious or something sensitive, put the phone down. And that young adult will model the same behavior. Or talk about it over dinner. Right? Put phones on the counter and just casually bring it up. Right? The more you talk about uncomfortable topics like human trafficking, um, the easier they are for that young adult to come to someone um, and say something feels off or maybe that they need help. And use non-judgmental attitude and language. One of the biggest fears among young adults um, is the fear of being judged, right? By their peers, by other adults in their life, okay? So it's one of the biggest things, non-judgmental attitude and language. Um, you know, saying things instead of like good and bad, mm, that's interesting, you know, tell me more, being, um, focusing on the situation at hand and not 
generalizing, right? And not being too vague and not drawing from other instances. Focus at what is currently happening and have that open line of communication, okay? Talk about the topics. Start talking about these topics of needing to be safe in public and online young, right? You know, you can have those conversations at an age appropriate level and the more familiar young adults are, they'll be more comfortable with the topic. And when they turn into adults, you know, they'll have education, they'll have awareness, right? They'll have, you know, tips to keep themselves safe, right? And one other thing about conversation and dialogue, especially with young adults, is if they're hanging around or if they want to go to the grocery store with you, they want to talk about something. And they may put it in the context of, oh, my friend. And it may really just be a friend, but it may be about them as well. So go back to that non-judgmental attitude and language and just listen okay? and help them make a safe choice. So Courtney and Dave and Mary Beth have talked a lot about the internet. It's 2020, right? Especially now during COVID, the internet is a huge way that individuals stay connected, but it can also be a huge way of causing harm, right? And, you know, Courtney talks a lot about that recruitment period and finding vulnerabilities, and that is happening online, okay? So some safety tips, right? Model best practice. If you are an adult and you have young adults in your life, you have children, you want them to be safe, you have to model that safe behavior online as well with what information you're putting out there, what pictures you're putting out there, who you're accepting as friends or followers, who you're talking to, right? Model those best practices. Even for adults, be aware of the information you're putting in your profile. So that bio section where you can put your name, your date of birth, where you work, all of that stuff, someone can use in a harmful way. So just be aware of what information is out there for anyone to grab, right? Don't put that personal information. So don't put the town you, you currently live in, the school you're currently going to, where you work. Um, for young adults, we tell them maybe don't put your first and last name. Put a nickname, right? Uh, when it comes to your profile picture, put like maybe like a dog or something. But same thing goes for adults. All those little pieces of information that you may think is just general out there, someone can use. Do not accept requests from unknown people or companies. So unknown people, you know, they may have like 1,200 friends. You may think, oh, they're not going to know who I am, and you accept them. Well. Anyone can be anyone on the internet, right? And someone can pretend to be a 15-year-old, you know, and try and talk to another 15-year-old. And it could be, you know, a 40-year-old person, right? And that's how they can start that recruitment, right? That Or that's how they can start asking for more personal information or photos, right? It can spiral. So anyone can be anyone on the internet, even if they have thousands of photos on their profiles, right? And companies, right? Just because the company that has 2,000 followers, you know, requests to follow you, look them up. Make sure they're credible. You know, someone can create anything on the internet and it may not even be real. Be aware of things in the background of photos that you may be posting. So are you outside? Is your street, in, your street name in it? Is your street address, license plates? Things like that can all be used in a harmful way, right? Um, also be aware of just general photos, right? Um, that are just being posted of where someone is in their home, things like that. And be aware of private messages and direct messages, so DMs, right? They are private conversations that not everyone can see. And this is where someone might start asking for more personal information or for personal photos. Okay, um, and Mary Beth touched upon that, right? Um, so just being aware, putting in those safe practices, okay, um, and just being aware of what location services are on. So you may have 1,200 friends, but one person in there may 
actually be so and they say they aren't and if you're posting photos and it says you're at you know this park with the date and timestamp they may show up right um so just be aware turn off the location services nobody needs to know where you are and what you're doing down to you know the outline of the building on certain apps and down to the minute right it's all about being safe and if you're an adult you have to be just as safe as children right so what to do if you feel um, something's suspicious or you have a concern about something, so reporting. Okay. So if you're in an emergency, right, call 911, right? Um, if you're in danger or you feel someone else is in danger, call 911, okay? If you have concerns about human trafficking or you have suspicions, um, you know, or if you yourself have concerns, um, contact your local human trafficking task force, right, which would be Dave. <laughs> um, the human trafficking hotline's on there. Um, if you are going through something or you have other questions, there's a mental health text line. Um, there's some national resources. Um, you may know someone in another state, right? Um, so you can always pass that information along. Along with education comes resources and knowing how to help someone, right, is just as important as raising awareness, right? Um, and then there's some ways to report to New York State, right? You may not be in Dutchess County, so there's New York State information, okay? Always reach out if you have a suspicion or if you see something going on, if, you know, something makes you feel nervous or scared, right? You can even contact your local police department. Um, make someone aware of it. Um, it could be something, it could be nothing, but it's better to be safe. Um, and just knowing those resources, because if you come across it or if you feel someone, you know, is being trafficked or they just need help, right? Know those resources. These are just some additional resources um, that we have. There's Shared Hope that has really great, down at the bottom, um, information on internet safety. Um, really great. and they have some really great information on how to start that conversation, especially with young adults. Um, there's you can't groove me um, org. That one's really great. Um, there's Courtney's website, right, of her foundation, and then there's the human trafficking hotline org. Um, and on the next slide are again just some more resources of national and state um, where you can get credible and factual information about human trafficking, right? And as Becca said, a lot of those myths go around and this is where you can actually, you know, build off of the information that Courtney and Dave and Mary Beth gave you of how to educate yourself, okay? And just know it's real information, right? Because those stories that have been shared, you know, a couple thousand times on Facebook and Instagram, may not always be true and it's kind of like the game of telephone by like the fifth sixth person the story has changed right and you're missing gaps of information and you know it may have really been three people and not one and so this is where you can get factual information and just resources on how to help yourself or someone in your life and it may not be now it may be a couple years from now but the information's there right and that's the best way to raise awareness is education, right? Because you may hear someone talking about that story on Facebook and you say, well, actually, you know, this is how most often someone gets, you know, trafficked and you can, you know, give them a resource and a website, right? And then um, there's Becca's and I's information if you have questions um, and our 24-hour hotline number, you know, as Courtney mentioned, you know, intersection of IPB and, you know, domestic violence um, or domestic violence agency. So there's our hotline 24 seven if someone needs it. Um, and just be safe. The internet um, is a very powerful thing. And, you know, so is social media. And that's how people are connecting and unfortunately using it for harm.
Thank you very much, Megan and Becca. Um, that was great information. We actually have a couple of questions and I'm going to um, put out to the panel for whoever would like to answer it. So the first question is, when do you think is the right age online safety with your children? I'd like to answer that one. So um, really the age that they start using technology, right? You see two-year-olds walking around with tablets, right? Um, so having that age appropriate. So if they are going to use a tablet, they make tablets for young children, right? So they can't surf the internet, um, you know, like a learning tablet. So start with that um, and just kind of start having that conversation like, um, the parent or caregiver will help them turn it on and set it up, right, and get them set up. Um, and that if something pops up, right, don't, you know, grab an adult around them so that they can click out of it, right? Um, you know, and not to judge them if they kind of accidentally click on something, right? Kids are curious, right? They look things up, but starting at young because kids are using technology young and how they can stay safe, right? And open that communication. So if something happens, right? Or if they make a mistake, they know they can come to an adult to help fix it and to stay safe um, and not feel the need to cover it up. Right? Anybody else? Um, I'd like to just kind of piggyback off of what Megan just said. I think at, at any age, and this goes for relationships on, and interactions online as well as in person, I think especially for young adults, kids and young adults, if they feel like they've already done something wrong, it is so hard for them to then go to a parent or to someone because they're already afraid. They already feel shameful. And so that is um, something that I think you can talk about in advance with your kids. I have teenagers at home and I almost consider healthy relationships and relationships and interactions online like a conversation you would have about drinking and not driving with alcohol. The goal is what's my first priority, what I say to my kids is your safety. If you've been drinking, I, in that moment, I don't care. I just want to make sure that you're okay and you're safe and you get home okay. After that, we'll have a conversation around what happened, but first and foremost, I want to make sure you're safe. So if you're over your head, it's okay. Come to me. We'll deal with that but I want you to be safe. And I think that's a really important thing that we can start saying about a wide variety of issues. I agree. Does anybody else have anything to add? I just wanted to add something to that too. Okay. So when we're looking at things with kids, we're also looking at things like sexting and that comes into play. And by the time that you have mentioned it to your child, if you wait, it's gonna to be too late. So we would always, always encourage parents have the conversations early you know we're, we're thinking like between the ages of nine and 12 because if you wait until they're in high school it's going to be too late the way the technology is and the way it's used yeah, that's a really good point thank you um, there's another question uh, what what resources do we have locally for trafficking victims i know we had the phone numbers i don't know if Maybe is that where a place where someone would go? I'm not sure. Is there anything that you guys want to add to that? If I start? Sure, David, yeah. So our task force worked really hard on creating a resource guide. And if you go to duchessny.gov and type in human trafficking, you can access the resource guide. Um, got a lot of practical tips in it, a lot of resources. Um, a lot of the information that we've created that we thought would be helpful for professionals and the community to access. For our youth who are homeless, we would access um, River Haven Shelter, Runaway Homeless Youth Shelter. Uh, if they need food and clothing, I can access food and clothing for them, um, as well as Courtney's Foundation. And I'm sure uh, Grace Smith House will help any youth who requires food and clothing. Um, the first step will be to identify them and find out from them what their needs are. 
And if I can piggyback Dave off that for a moment, if you go on and you see that resource guide, it's also on the Giveaway to Freedom website as well under resources. Um, it does a step-by-step -step kind of quick reference guide, literally step one, two, three, four, five, what you can do if you suspect that there's a victim. And then there's also right next to it, a list of services for youth and a youth and also for adults. Um, so it's easy, easy numbers uh, to call hotline numbers, shelter numbers, emergency numbers. Thank you, Kanye. In Putnam County, again, um, we have the app. It's Putnam, it's Safe Harbor, Putnam County. And we are, we have all kinds of resources on that. That's excellent. Um, I didn't see any more questions that anybody came up with. Are there any questions that people have asked you that um, that you could think of that maybe to bring up before we end our conversation? Um, sometimes people just don't think about the questions and they might call us afterwards or, you know, something that, you know, you guys might have dealt with before that we didn't talk about yet. I guess if, if I could just make a statement. Yeah. Um, just want people to know that uh, we don't rescue individuals. That's not our role to go out and try and save um, individuals from being trafficked. We provide prevention education. We also provide support for those identified as being at risk of being trafficked or have been trafficked. So we're not, um, we're not the police. We are not doing investigations at the local uh, spa to find out if there's anyone being trafficked. I get a lot of calls of, I, I just got off the train and some guys following me and that's a call for the police. So mm -hmm. um, not that I don't want to listen and hear them and I will drive my car down and take a look, um, but we really don't rescue. So that's a, a police issue. Okay. And I know, uh, Dave, to piggyback in Dutchess County, what we do encourage, it's hard sometimes when if you do feel like you want to call the police, what we've been trying to do is encourage everyone, at least in Dutchess County, to call Dutchess County Sheriff. Um, mm -hmm. Because that way, everyone's not calling different stations. If one person calls the town of Poughkeepsie Police and another person calls Dutchess County Sheriff and another person calls Hyde Park Police, all about the same situation, they're not going to necessarily know that oh, there's actually been three calls um, about a particular place. Um, or something that's being seen. So we encourage, at least in Dutchess County, that if you are going to call law enforcement, we're asking people to to call Dutchess County Sheriff. That's great. And girls, did you have anything else to add? Or? Um, you know, when it comes to internet safety and just the remote world and being safe, um, you know, just be cautious that anything that's put out there you know, you may delete it, but someone could have screenshotted it and there's always, it's always out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just be aware. Um, when we do talk to young adults, we tell them like that can come up three, 10 years from now, right? When you're applying for a job and for college and, you know, um, and just to be safe and, you know, the internet is tricky. <laughs> You know, someone's not always who they say they are. And, you know, if you go to school with them and you see them every day, be friends with them, right? If it's someone that you've never met and they have six other friends with you in common, ask the six other people who that is. And if they can't tell you, right, you can make a choice whether you want to have them as a friend or not, right? You know, just always look into things and just be safe and find a trusted adult in your life that you can go to um, if you need help or have questions. That's great. Um, yeah, thank, were you gonna add something back or? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, we got another question, sorry. I thought that, uh, what is it? Oh, what can community organizations like churches do to help with education, prevention, et cetera? That's a great question. And I know like I've been, some of the churches did get involved uh, with doing some awareness uh, outreach, which is excellent. But um, do you guys have an answer to that too? I can weigh in on that. So I know that for myself and Megan, if someone were, to, someone were to reach out to us and ask us for education, 
we can provide that to various agencies around Dutchess County, two different groups. I know Dave provides education as well. Um, so if you're ever unsure and you reach out to Megan, she can always direct you to who the right person might be for setting up that informational session. So Courtney did a good job of training, uh, I believe it was six or seven of our task force members in Human Trafficking 101. And we're all anxious to get out there and talk to anybody. I have talked, did pr done presentations at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Poughkeepsie. Um, and I did a talk out in Amenia. So we will go anywhere in the county. Um, we like to first educate those uh, individuals on trafficking before we actually ask them to participate. But things like uh, creating backpacks for supplies for youth who um, run away and, and are out in the street, those things are helpful if they want to uh, organize an event like that. But to be educated first by one of our many trainers wouldn't be a good idea, an awareness event. Yes, and certainly reach out to Dave. Um, you know, we now have, yeah, I think seven of us or so in the county that can go out and train. So thank you for joining because it's a lot of, a lot to run around and, and do so many, but now that we have a bunch of people to do it, we can spread ourselves out more. And again, in Putnam County, um, I'm here, I'm available, and we would love to speak with anyone. That's great. And I can't thank everybody enough for doing this, you know, especially when we think about everybody's, we're doing this virtually. Everybody's inside right now. And, you know, our, our kids are home, basically, and they're on the internet. So I think it's really important just as awareness is the key to prevention. And I know we had some great participation tonight and it's recorded. So we're going to be able to share it. But if anybody that is watching has additional questions, they can call any of the resources that they saw here tonight that is recorded, or they could call our office at 229-0106. And I wanna say a special thank you to Courtney and David and Mary Beth and Megan and Becca. Um, you guys are amazing for the work that you do. I can't thank you enough. And a lot of people don't realize that trafficking is here. It, it's here. Uh, Dutch is Putnam. It's like in every neighborhood, in every corner, right, as has has been told. So uh, thank you for helping us with this and for joining in in our virtual meeting tonight. I greatly appreciate it.